Welcome to the Theology Pugcast. It's great to have you here for this special episode. We're going to do something a little different today, and I'll explain it in a moment. But uh, just to get the ball rolling in the way we normally do, I'm C.R. Wiley, and I'm a pastor. I serve a church in the Pacific Northwest. I've written a number of things. And I am a senior editor at Touchstone Magazine. Okay, enough about me. How about you, Tom? I'm Tom Price. I teach, I write, I speak. Uh, one of the places I teach is Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, where I teach uh, Christian ethics and theology. Great. Glenn? I'm Glenn Sunshine, retired history professor, senior fellow at Colson Center for Christian Worldviews, Ministry Associated Reflections Ministries, and I've got my own 501c3, Every Square Inch Ministries. Okay. Well, we're doing a uh, a uh, question-themed uh, episode today. We have Patreon supporters, uh, and we love those folks. They make the show possible. And every once in a while, we ask them uh, for questions. Uh, we ask them, what do you want us to address? And we have a number of questions that have been provided. We uh, won't be able to get to them all, but uh, I think we can get to some. And uh, I think... Uh, a good one to begin with is a question that Patrick asked, and it's this. Uh, uh, he says, you may have done this uh, in a past episode, but would you be willing to give a history of how the three of you met and what drew you together as friends, what originally brought you all together, and now that you, you're uh, all, uh, all scattered to different places, except you, Tom, you remain steadfast. Uh, how have you found your friendship with one another has shaped the direction uh, or directed new friendships? Okay, well, I think that's a great one. Well, um, just uh, a kind of a history lesson for folks. Uh, uh, Glenn and I knew each other first, um, and we had been encouraged to get to know each other for some time, although it was kind of slow in developing. Uh, there were people I knew that said, you need to talk to Glenn. There were people Glenn knew that said, you need to talk to Wiley. And finally, we got together. And uh, not long after that, we decided to start an apologetics ministry uh, there in Manchester, Connecticut. And we met, what was it, about a year and a half, two years, Glenn? Yeah, something like that. Actually, we originally met at a um, Jonathan Edwards forum at your church. Oh, yeah, yeah. You invited me to participate in a panel discussion with um, um, Mars Hill Audio Guy. Blanking oh, yeah, 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 Ken, Ken. Yeah, Ken Myers, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so that, that's that, where we met. And yeah. then you contacted me about starting a theology pub at um, an apologetics ministry at, um, at a restaurant. And then meanwhile, I had a bunch of people telling me I needed to meet Tom, and Tom had a bunch of people telling him he should meet me, and we got together at the Corner Pug for lunch one day, yeah. and I invited Tom to speak at the Theology Pub. Yeah, that's right. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that so was he, where I, I first met you, you Tom. Yep. I was at when you presented at the pub. Yep. Right. Oh, no. And then Tom presented a couple of times there. Yeah. Yeah. And then I don't know that it was really our fault, but the restaurant closed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know they blamed us. <laughs> Having fun with that. But yeah, what happened, we were we were at a place called the Adams Mill, which was a pretty cool spot. Yeah, and they were very nice helpful. Uh, and then they sold. They sold out. Uh, yeah. They just closed up and sold it to a, uh, a, a different, kind of a brew pub kind of thing. That became uh, really loud. We, we do you remember do we did an episode there? <laughs> <laughs> it was impossible. And uh, but but what happened is after the Adams Mill closed, Glenn and I uh, said, you know, uh, and this is of course after we knew you, Tom, and we, yeah. we were friends with you. Uh, we said, how are we going to keep this thing going? We have about maybe two hundred people that had come out to these things. So the way it would work is we'd have uh, somebody who was an authority on a subject and was a Christian, and uh, we'd have that person speak about the subject uh, he or she knew about, and uh, we'd use that as an occasion to invite friends out. 
So when Tom spoke initially, you spoke, I think, on a on an eco- ecological uh, on a kind of a, a kind of a right. yep. creation theme, yeah. uh, and you were basically, if I remember right, saying, "Well, I mean, I, they're, they've got some good points, but they kind of go nuts." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind they, of, run, they run the wrong direction with a good thing, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, but we had other people. We had, you know, uh, a sociologist from UConn, uh, well-known uh, Christian who. Uh, is is you know a, a, a cool guy, and we had another physicist from UConn. We had a number of UConn people, yeah. And actually, Glenn was part of the UConn network of, of uh, colleges. I mean, Eastern Connecticut State University. Central, please, Central. Yeah, se- oh yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's, right. Yeah. that's right. Yeah, Eastern is over in like a Willimantic, if I remember right. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I did two or three of them, maybe four. I did, you know, I did a bunch. Yeah, yeah, but you were in the state school system, and a number of our people were coming from the stores campus. But anyway, um, so that's how that played out. And then we said, "Wow, we were cut off uh, from all the folks that we had connected with. What can we do?" While we're w- trying to figure out where we could meet, we said, "Let's do a podcast." And then I think you or Tom suggested the corner pug. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they yeah, tolerated I, I, I us think, for a while. They, yeah. <laughs> we we um we we decided to bring Tom. You know, you you talked to me about it, and we decided we really wanted to bring Tom on board. And Tom is just a couple of blocks from the corner pug. Yeah, so I, I can I can still walk there. <laughs> yeah, I just so, might later this afternoon. <laughs> so, so we started meeting there, and the original shtick was that you know we're having a conversation in in the pub, and you you can sit in on it. Mm-hmm. You know, that that was kind of the concept. And, uh, you know, I thought maybe if we were lucky, we'd hit 300 people. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it 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 worked really well, except the background music. And you guys, <laughs> uh, the, the early listeners got to know our taste in beer. And, um, you know, it was, it was fun. So. Yeah, I, and I, I miss the, all of that. And, yeah. you know, even after the corner pug discouraged us from coming, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did, they didn't realize that we had made them famous, I guess. But anyway, being fair, I'm not sure they really discouraged us from coming. But around Christmas, things were getting kind of tense just because of the the situation. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think they would have they would have been happy to have us continue. But yeah, we decided to try a couple of other places. Yeah. And, and none of them really worked out. And um and then you moved to Washington. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a complication. But the first thing was COVID. You know, yeah. we, initially oh, yeah. we were all like, "Where are we where are we going to be in anyway?" Because nobody is yeah. uh, open. And so that's when we started doing Riverside, and then it just kind of carried over to to the situation we have now. Because I moved away, and then Glenn moved. But that's that's the backstory. Yeah. I guess one of the things to note about you know when you're in uh, in New England um, and you're a, a serious, uh, you know, and orthodox Christian, and you're in, engaged in academic, uh, you know, pursuits. You you kind of learn about each other. Yeah. Uh, so there's a there's kind of a net there's a kind of natural network that develops in a place like that that might not develop as I guess automatically like maybe in the in the American South or even the Midwest. Um, it just. You, you know, you when you're in that setting, you're like looking for allies. You know, yeah, so. yeah. You, you're aware that you're outnumbered, uh, right. <laughs> and right. that al- almost everyone around you doesn't think like you do. <laughs> right, right. So when you find somebody that's, you know, on, on the same page as you, ninety-five to ninety-nine percent of the time, it's like a last of yeah. somebody I can talk to and not argue with. Uh, well, you can that's argue, right. but you can, but it's a different kind of thing. That's right. Uh, instead of arguing whether you know uh, a boy can be a girl, you're arguing about whether or not. Aristotle is important and uh, why he is and stuff like that. Well, uh, so that gives a little bit of background on on us and how we got to know each other. Um, let's go on to another question here. This one's from Jackson Ledford, and uh, it's a good question. It's something we, I think we've touched on a little bit here and there. It's certainly something that I remember talking about when I was in my last graduate program. And it's uh, the question is one of McIntyre's. This is Alistair McIntyre. Mm-hmm. Uh, McIntyre's conclusions in After Virtue is that in ethical discussions we have a choice between Aristotle or Nietzsche. 
While I agree, agree with this, much of the Protestant church today rejects using Aristotle as a framework. How do, you, uh, how do we persuade the church that by not accepting Aristotle, they will inevitably fall into a Nietzschean framework? That's an interesting thing. I'm not, I think he's begging the question a little bit. I, I don't think that's automatic. Uh, I do think that there are some other possibilities, but yeah. I think though, even so, some do. <laughs> yeah. And I've, I've, I've come across, uh, like take, take for example, uh, you know, in the circles that we uh, run in, um, the the term dominion is uh, kind of a uh, kind of a, a a call to action, right? But sometimes I get the sense that the people who uh, you know call for that look at the world in a way that maybe is more in, yeah, sort of in keeping with uh, kind of the the modern project, yeah, which. Of course, you know, Nietzsche is just one sort of kind of maybe like one of the last. He's a transitional figure, obviously. He's kind of the postmodern. But um, this idea that it's us imposing our will on a meaningless world. Um, yeah. And I kind of I kind of get the sense that sometimes they think that the Bible is even alien to the to the creation and yeah. that we have to impose the Bible on the Plato right. of reality. The creator, that, in a it, sense, is, is, is understood as just imposing a will, and because the creator is the biggest power around, the creator gets to do it, and everyone either submits willfully or gets crushed. Yeah, 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 and, and I've, I've heard that kind of, <laughs> that oh, kind yeah. of talk. <laughs> yeah, and that, you know, so, and that is exactly what Christians early on tried to prevent <laughs> that kind of, right. that view of things. Now, getting back to Aristotle, you know, Aristotle, uh, when we think about, you know, his project, you know, there's obviously, uh, you know, one of the important um, frameworks within which he understands reality is teleology. So he's, mm -hmm. he's thinking about the purposes of things. Now, uh, he lacks the Christian understanding of, naturally, uh, of how the world came into being. Uh, nevertheless, uh, at least, uh, in the, uh, imminent frame, you know, he's looking at creatures and he's looking at things and he's thinking about what, what are these things for? And he's approaching matters in a fairly commonsensical way. In fact, that's part of his, that's his mode, you know, it's yeah. basically what is the common understanding and is it sound? And if so, yeah. You know what is it? Why is it sound and stuff like that? Yeah, they the 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 thing that all figures, ancient philosophers, and the church all the way up, pretty much until it's certain breaks within the the Middle Ages, right, the medieval period, shared pretty much a realist view of creation. What do I mean by that? That it is intelligible that it has form and its form is oriented towards the fulfillment of those different forms, kinds. I mean, Scripture says, let there be and let it unfold a particular way. That is what's consistent with it. Christianity, when it enters into the, you know, the Hellenic world, has some philosophical tools that it can use, but they're steeped in limited visions and distorted visions. At first, Christianity is basically antithetical to them. Later, it realizes once we can rid these good insights from this bad, you know, fuller picture and replace it with a Christian vision, they can help us unpack these things as a tool. And so Plato and Aristotle become tools for Christians. Sometimes they use the tools too much, and you get some things that the church has to go back and say, Let's not use the tool too much that, in that way. But these origins things are an example. Yeah, origins yeah. an example of that. Yeah, that's that's right. So you have an example of that would be you know sort of what happens in ends up happening with transubstantiation for Protestants, right? When you have certain kinds of understanding of causality and the nature of form and matter and their relationship that get interpreted to where they eclipse some of the distinctions that need to be made. Um, but those debates all took place within a recognition that there is a reality that is intelligible. And part of that intelligibility is that there is form to things and there is fulfillment of that form, meaning there are real natures that have an inherent 
design. And when those, when they enact themselves as the creatures they are, they fulfill themselves to what they're created to be. And so Aristotle and Plato, they shared those, even though they didn't share them in the rich Christian vision um, the same way. So h- how would you respond, Tom? I, I know you have a response, and mm-hmm. I know Glenn has a response, and I have a response, but how would you respond to somebody who would say, well, then why can't we use Marx yeah. uh, in the same way? Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I think if what is go- one is going to be able to get well, l- let me back up a step. Usually what is happening with a lot of philosophies that come after the Christian impact is they're either responding to it and rejecting it, or they're highlighting something of it that happened to get de-emphasized or not fixed. What do I mean by that? Well, there were obviously economic issues of exploitation, as any society has. Marx happens to take a Christian notion that exploitation is wrong, and then he makes it the whole package and he reduces everything to that. So just like a heresy where you take a truth, but you don't have the full picture of that truth and you run with it and make it everything, that's what you have with Marx. So if all you're going to say is, okay, I can learn from Marx that we should take seriously exploitation and oppression, Fine. Christians have been saying that all along, and maybe they haven't said it loud enough with their own resources. But the direction that Marx goes is somewhere that is fundamentally antithetical to so many of the core aspects of of reality as reality as Christians understand it. So uh, you know, it's like anything. You 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 can measure these things because there is an intelligible way to weigh them, and we have a truth content that can evaluate whether or not those things can be useful or not in any way. Um, and, and so, you know, again, I think some Christians where they make the mistake is they think they can merely baptize Marx because Marx had some points that were similar to Christianity, but they end up taking along with it the distortions of reality that come from rejecting the fuller Christian vision that Marx had. Any thoughts, Glenn? Yeah, uh, Tom went exactly where I would have gone, that Marxism is fundamentally a Christian heresy. And it lacks an, it la- lacks a comprehensive vision of the world. It substitutes a very narrow way of understanding human relations um, in place of the more full-orbed, richer vision, the multifaceted vision you get with uh, Aristotle. Um, and that that's fundamentally, you know, the, this narrowed scope, this very, well, heresy, this very narrow picture, one-dimensional picture of reality is really fundamentally the the problem for Marx as a foundation for ethics. You know, yeah, he is onto something. Oppression is wrong. Economic injustice is something that is roundly condemned in Scripture. But so is a whole lot of other stuff. <laughs> and you need to look at things in a more holistic way rather than reducing everything to economic determinism. Yeah. And, you know, another thing to note, of course, is Marx was an atheist and Marx expressly is rejecting, you know, uh, the Christian God. Uh, but also he's, he's a materialist. Yeah. And so uh, whatever he's he's doing uh, – uh, Re, you know, excludes what yeah. we think is the most important dimension of reality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so there, there's that. But the other, another thing is, is because he's a materialist and because he's drawing on Hegel, um, you know, he's bringing in from, you know, f- from the direction of Hegel, a way of understanding the nature of reason and its development that is fundamentally at odds with the Christian understanding of the Lagos. So it, it, we're, we're talking about one kind of sliver of a much larger kind of, uh, phenomenon. And, uh, and that one sliver is it's, it's bad to exploit, uh, people. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. We yeah. we can agree with that, but everything else, uh, Carl, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're wrong about everything yeah. else. Now, when we well, get to Aristotle, mm-hmm. so like you know, he, he you know, Marx would even rejected, you know, pretty commonsensical uh, notions of of, telia, of the of the telos, yeah. uh, 
even with regard to the sexes and things like that. So he's a he's a he's a modern thinker, and if we think about modern modern thinkers as people who are rejecting the Christian core of the West, uh, then you know we're like you noted, Tom. We're talking about a whole different order of philosophy. Yeah, and and that he- Hegelian point is is a big point too, because although Hegel was trying to retrieve a lot of things that the Enlightenment lost hold of, especially the intelligibility of being, Hegel imports a whole different notion of being, basically being as becoming, which 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 is is not as you know which Christians were able to articulate in a much richer philosophical frame because of Plato and Aristotle, the the absolute um, plenitude, infinite plenitude of being that God is, that God doesn't um, have to develop or change to come into his own, that he doesn't have to basically develop an identity through history, right? Um, That he is from everlasting to everlasting, the great I am. And so uh, different philosophical tools can impact how you interpret those passages. And uh, post-Hegel, even a lot of the theology, even Karl Barth wrestled with it, this notion of God's being as becoming becomes problematic. Well, let's move on to another question here. Um, This is again from Jackson. uh, And he's uh, wondering about uh, Athanasius uh, uh, and uh, his work on the Incarnation. He says he's been thinking about that a lot lately, Mm -hmm. particularly with respect to his view on being non-being, and the path to heaven and hell. One of his main points is that because of the fall into sin, man was in decay, headed towards non-being. In the incarnation, Christ, uh, who made uh, man first, now remakes man and reunites him with the original source of being. One of the conclusions in this line of thinking, I think uh, David Bentley Hart would agree, uh, might uh, be to read Athanasius uh, as some kind of annihilationist. Mm-hmm. I think that language is anachronistic, he, he notes. How are we to understand hell in terms of the philosophical language of being and non-being, especially with respect to the traditional view of evil as the absence of being? I'd love to uh, some book recommendations. So this is something I've thought a lot about, and I do think uh, is, uh, a, you know, uh, a kind of, a, an important, uh, matter to address within the framework we, we all accept. Um, perhaps as a suggested, uh, popular work that actually is addressing this, uh, C.S. Lewis and the Great Divorce, I think yeah. is a, is a great yeah. source for this. Uh, what you have, uh, in the Great Divorce is, um, a bus ride uh, where a bunch of damned ghosts, and that's not swearing, that's just literally the case, <laughs> get on a bus to heaven and ta- take a holiday there. And they discover it's a very unpleasant experience uh, or, to, or place for them to be because they're not equipped, uh, they're not real. They're not real in the same sense as the people who uh, belong there are real. And because of that, it's nothing but torment to them. And, th- and in the course of conversation, uh, by the way, one of the ghosts is, is Lewis. He, he, he pictures himself in, uh, you know, in the outskirts of hell at the beginning of the story. So this is almost like, you know, uh, Dante in reverse. Yeah, you know? yeah, good. Very good. <laughs> he's, he's in hell. Uh, he's not going into hell to explore it. He's already there. <laughs> and he gets on the bus, and, the, and when all of the characters arrive uh, in heaven, and they're not, not really even in deep heaven. They're like on the very boundary, the, the, the outskirts. So in both cases, uh, in the beginning of the story, they're on the bound, sort of the boundary of hell. They're not in deep hell, so to speak. And in the in the in heaven they're on you know the uh, the kind of the front porch, so uh, but each of the characters each of the ghosts is met by someone uh, he or she knew in life, who is uh, you know um, one of the elect has been redeemed uh, has been glorified, and now comes to meet them and get to give them one last chance to repent, and uh, the only. This is a fascinating thing to consider. The only the only person uh, who repents in the account is the guy with the sex problem, <laughs> uh, and everybody else though 
uh, and what which which what's kind of implied is that the way that a person who with a with kind of in a sex what we would call maybe a sex mm-hmm. fixation or addiction uh, or just you know captive to lust is 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 doing something that's less reprehensible than some of the other spirits who were ghosts who were there. But anyway, uh, Lewis is met by George MacDonald. And <laughs> in the in the course of the conversation, uh, their conversation, uh, Lewis talks about the vastness of hell. And uh, MacDonald says, no, lad, or whatever. <laughs> uh, and he takes a, a blade of grass and he leans down to the to the to the ground and identifies a crack, a small crack. And he says, although I'm not sure this is the, is the crack, uh, <laughs> you can be certain that, uh, forgive my terrible act, you know, Scottish You're brogue. Brogue. <laughs> but anyway, he says, Your West you, can Coast cer- brogue. <laughs> <laughs> you can be certain that, uh, that what you, what you came out of was no larger than this. Hmm. So the, what, what Lewis presents is, a process of eternal damnation in which you diminish eternally, kind of like the Incredible Shrinking Man. Do you remember that that uh, 1950s story uh, where you know a guy, you know, it's always atomic energy that ruins you. But this guy, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, he starts to shrink, and he thinks he's going to disappear into nothing, and then he realizes, no, you just get smaller and smaller and smaller forever, and he he, he takes kind of cons- he takes that as a consolation that he's going to discover things that no other human being has ever seen because he's going to maybe be as small as a neuron I guess or <laughs> something <laughs> like that but but I think that's that's Lewis's um point is that the flight from non-being is eternal it's not like you right. you wink out at some point yeah yeah there it's you know it is it's very difficult to to spell out in metaphysical language all that's going on there. Um, <clears throat> this is where you're the balancing act between the revelatory content and the limits of our metaphysics. Um, I mean, even to be able to imagine what privation is like, the way that it impacts our, you know, us eternally. Um, and so I, I don't think it classic Christianity, and for the most part, again, I know there are figures that people like David Hart will talk about where we're kind of Christian universalists or annihilationists. But on the whole, the consensus has been that those aspects of scripture are emphasizing this as an eternal, not an annihilationalist view of things. Um, and I know some people argue about, you know, issues about you know, God's love and, and all of that. But again, this is <clears throat> this is a place at which have people who reject the grace and love of God in their own creatureliness, in the own goodness of their createdness. I mean, this is basically what our rebellion is, ingratitude of receiving our creatureliness from God, right? And wanting to be godlike without God, wanting to be something else than a creature. Um, you're not going to be happy in a place at which that is what is is embraced fully and oriented towards God as love and source of all things. That is hell for you as much. Um, on the other side, what is what is it that that you can escape from eternally and becomes the kind of con, you know the condemned state? It's it's the giving over to the sickness of absolute (laughs) self-love, you know, in the selfish sense of the word. Um, The self continuously that is given the gift of being, but rebelling against it eternally and turning in on itself. Right. One of the difficulties in the, one of the standard evangelical definitions of, of hell is eternal separation from God. One of the difficulties with that is if God is the source of being, then eternal separation from the source of being means you are in non-being, you cease to exist. Yeah. So there, there's a limitation on, you know, that, that way of looking at things doesn't, you know, when you're looking at it on a philosophical or metaphysical level, it doesn't really work. It doesn't say what you want it to say. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've, I've often thought about this in terms of, you know, particularly through Augustine and the privative nature of evil, what does that have to do, what, is, what are the implications of that uh, for, um, for, for hell? 
Um, and it does seem to lead in the direction potentially of annihilation. I do like the idea of ever, ever diminishment, though. I think that that is probably a better way of understanding what's going on there because it certainly sounds like you're, you're in a situation where your final state is eternal. It is not terminal. Yeah. Right, right. And I think, too, it does justice to the language of Scripture with regard to destruction. Uh, you know, when we think about what is uh, eternal destruction is what we're, to, what we're getting at, this, this never-ending process of dissolution, which strikes you as contradictory, but that's because uh, we th are thinking about the physical world. Uh, that's yeah. our analog um, and we can't can't get at this other rea this other dimension of to reality. Yeah, it it makes sense. Uh, I, I was thinking a lot about this recently. When we think about the relationship of reason to being, rationality uh, and being, uh, what the classical view maintained is that. Reality is the basis of knowledge. Uh, that they're they're co-extant. Uh, that you yeah. can't really separate them. So That's if something right. is, it's rational. That's right. right. That's right. Uh, it's grounded. So, in, it's grounded in being. Ra rationality is grounded in the nature of being. Yeah, but the modern view is that rationality is just some kind of calculation that occurs yeah. in your skull, yeah. and it can be out of touch with reality or not. Uh, yeah. You know and. And even when it's not, you're not really entirely able to maintain that. <laughs> you're not entirely sure that's the case. That's you know, that's what uh, Kant and Hume and all those guys were wrestling with uh, yeah. because they had accepted this this idea that that um, you know reason is not really bound up with the things as they are. But anyway, uh, ready to go on to the next question here? Yes. Uh, this is from Dave's. Is it D A V large S? So I'm, I guess it's Dave with maybe a capital S for last name. So anyway, uh, this is this is a this is a fun question, and uh, uh, he actually this is kind of two questions in one, and uh, I'll just go ahead and read it. So the, he says the decline in beauty in architecture seems to be mirrored by the decline in dressing well. It's hard to argue with that. <laughs> uh, we can't fix buildings, but we can fix our clothing. Well, I would say we can fix buildings. I've actually yeah. seen uh, there is a, a movement in Europe to take some of the monstrous buildings that were built in you know in the modern period and kind of retrofit them to to, to seem more baroque uh, or mm -hmm. you know classical. But anyway, getting to his point, should we try to dress better? Example, uh, e.g., tailored suits. Uh, he's got a second part of the question I'll get to that relates specifically to you, Glenn. But uh, let's ta let's tackle <laughs> this this first part. So, what do you think? Um, any thoughts about how we dress? I mean, here we are, all dressed in suits, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm wearing my at home suit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there there might be there might be a, a bunch of guys out there that would say, "Hey, well, I you know we have vest we we've got vestments in my my tradition." Yeah, but I've seen right. guys wearing Converse sneakers underneath their vestments and jeans. Yeah. You know, so you know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. any thoughts? I mean, I, I think they're sort of a, careful to tread here. Um, there is a certain aesthetic um, that can develop where it is reaching for higher aesthetic ends, if you will, um, to where that can be manifest very well in the way in which we dress. Um, what do I mean by that? I do think that when we care about beauty and goodness ever more deeper ways, that is an area in which it can fully leave its mark well. Um, and I think that a church and a church trying to walk in its richer things um, has at certain times had an antenna for that. That's why there were certain times, even when I was a child, 
everyone always wore their quote unquote Sunday best, even when most people went home and were pagans the rest of the week. Um, and why? Was that just kind of a legalistic change or was there something in the, the higher aim for getting a hold of a distinction that marked its way even in the way we dressed that expressed something of of a, a deeper aesthetic, a deeper deeper appreciation for the way we look, and in our relation to God and important, significant kinds of things. Um, now, how far to take it? Um, you know, that's that's a good p- point to discuss. Glenn, you have any thoughts? If you go to an African American church, everybody is dressed to the nines. That's true. Everybody. Um, it can be done. Mm-hmm. Um, I it, it, something I read a while ago ha, has kind of s- struck me. People who go to a wedding or a funeral dress up, but somehow they don't dress up when they go to worship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, and although it, although unfortunately I'm seeing that that even decay. Yeah, um, yeah. well. Well, and, so, and, and, mm-hmm. there, and I think that, that that says something about our attitude toward worship. Now, it's sort of a separate question, but I, but I think it, it's a good point that, you know, you watch, you watch old films. Sure. You know, uh, guys in the 30s were, you know, people walking down the street were wearing jackets and ties, mm-hmm. you know, just people out on the street. Mm-hmm. Young construction workers would be going to work with jackets and ties. Now, they might take them off when they were working, but they w- would wear them there. That was just simply what you did. Mm-hmm. Um, and they built beautiful buildings. Mm-hmm. So I, th- I think he's on to something. And I think that that yeah. maybe recovering a, a better dress code would be a, a really good idea. Yeah, I think one of the things that needs to occur is a, a kind of larger sort of cultural move in this mm-hmm. in respect. So you noted uh, the phenomenon of uh, well-dressed African-American churchgoers. And I've, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've been in many of those churches. And when I go to a church that's African-American, I, I, I make certain that I dress up because I know everybody else in the room is going to be dressed up. And I guess that's what I'm getting at. Uh, they've been able to maintain, yeah. at least in some parts of the African-American community, I, I imagine that maybe some of the buppies, the black urban professional you know, world, f- for folks who aren't privy to that sort of sub, you know, category or subculture within the larger African-American, they're kind of more hipsterish and stuff they, they're kind of trending with a lot of that other stuff. but everything about those churches is also kind of distinct <coughs> but i guess uh uh so here here's the thing that i think a lot about <coughs> um how i dress as a pastor so i wear a tie and a jacket every week uh but it's an off the ra- off the rack jacket usually although i do have uh you know some tailored suits and I want you to know getting a nice tailored suit is not an inexpensive proposition. We're talking That's thousands true. of dollars for something yeah, like that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I have to think about, okay, who else is in the room? What's the range of, uh, you know, attire that I'm likely to, to, to see? Um, so I, I try to position myself in such a way that I can, you know, stand uh, next to uh, people who are dressed kind of uh, over this 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 range, <clears throat> I've got people in my my congregation who do wear tailored suits. Yeah, I can look at them and say, "That's a tailored suit," <laughs> um, and I know what they do for a living, and I know that they probably paid thousands of dollars for that suit. Um, when it comes to um, uh, some of the other folks, you know, they're they really are working class people, and and uh, probably just wearing their nicest shirt and maybe some khakis or something like that. And then you got people who come in with torn jeans and all that kind of stuff. Now, yeah. the question I've got is, uh, what is my role in terms of shaping them up? And um, I think that it's a challenging question to to answer. Mm-hmm. I don't have an easy. So even even in my daily uh, what you know what I wear on a daily basis. Um, it really 
I, I put a lot of thought into it. Mm -hmm. Um, everything from the watch I wear to the shoes I wear to the pants I wear, the, the shirt I wear, um, it's intended to kind of say a, 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 a set of things, yeah. uh, and, I'm, and I'm conscious of it. Uh, I don't just throw on whatever you know appeals to me. Although I like the things I, I wear, so that's another dimension of it. I, I think about you know not only how it communicates, but do I like it? But there's a lot that comes into play uh, when yeah. you think about this. Yeah, and you don't want it. You don't, on the one hand, want it to be kind become a kind of elitism. Some people can get, you know, kind of top made tailor suits, and then the other people kind of feel like, okay, well, that becomes the thing that's emphasized, and we can't match up. You know, I mean, scripture talks okay. a lot about that. You who have the finest of this, that, and the other, and sit in the best seats, you know, kind of look down on the others. But then the flip side is, how do we how do we model forth something of the mm -hmm. richer vision we have as a community contributing even to culture, salt and light, that says maybe wearing sweatpants everywhere you go is a downgrade <laughs> to to <laughs> everyone, <laughs> including well, yourself. Yeah. Well, that, that, so that, that's another thing. So yeah. uh, are you demonstrating respect when you... Uh, dress up. I think you are. So I, I remember years ago, I had this kind of, I had this kind of um, juxtaposition experience. So, I, you know, I've been a pastor for years and I was in a particular place and I had some people in my congregation I liked a lot and they would come to church every, every Sunday, like they just rolled out of bed, you know, literally. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember one time uh, I, we kind of ran into each other and they were dressed just like, uh, you know, they were going to meet the president of the United States or something. And uh, I thought to myself, aha, you do have nice clothes. Yeah. That's what I thought to myself. And I thought, yeah. um, why, you know, and, and not that I held it against them or anything, but it was yeah. just, it was, a, it, was a, it was puzzling to me. Curiosity. That, you know, they were going to this special event uh, and they, it really was evident that it was special to them. Uh, yeah. And they wanted to fit in and 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 mm. pay their respects to the people who were running the event, but it didn't occur to them that this is the sort of thing that should happen in church. Yeah. Okay. Anything else anybody wants to say about uh, that particular thing before we move on here? Well, one last thing. I, I remember uh, when I lived in UK as a student, they I was able to buy a lot of the clothes that came out of Europe, and one of the things that was I. I, I bit apparent was the Europeans took a lot of care to have, especially for men's clothing, to have it fit well and right. And it looks exceptional on you. You don't have to go to too, a tailor and everything to fix it once you get your size right. And when I would wear the shirts or the jackets back to the U.S., I would have people stop me and say, where in the world did you get that? Um, and that says something. Um, they, you know, I don't know how much it continues, but I remember as a student there being able to get really um, fine fitting and looking uh, clothing that just the aesthetic of it was something they cared when they made the product. It wasn't just thrown on a, you know, manufacturing right. line and just ended up, you know, one size fits all. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so here's one that's uh, uh, addressing you, Glenn. He says, every time Glenn lets the verbal breaks off in a particular historical discourse, <laughs> I learn about five incredible new things in five minutes. Well, there you go. He, he thinks you're great, Glenn. We think you are too. Uh, I would love to watch a course on world history taught by him. Have you ever done something like that, Glenn? Uh, is that something maybe we should try to sponsor? Well, I have certainly done that at the university. Um, I've done world history. I'm better at Western history. Um, but yeah, I have done those kinds of things. So I've thought about putting one together maybe for homeschooling or something like that, but I haven't actually taken the time to do it yet. Yeah, maybe we there's, could there's a lot involved in preparing and recording that kind of thing, particularly if you want to do it right with visuals and maps and all that sort of thing. Right, um, right. So there's a lot of work that's involved. It could be a, yeah. a first course in PugCast University. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, you guys have been roped into some other uh, programs that uh, offer courses, and uh, yeah. so that'd be in the spirit of that. But yeah. um, maybe we could 
do something with our friend George Grant. I mean, George, that's kind of his, kind of oh. in his wheelhouse. But oh, anyway, yeah. that's it'd be that's fun great to do to something with George. Yeah, yeah. Now, this next question is from Jacob, uh, and he says, uh, "Can you give us a sketch of the history of and theological justification, however erroneous, of the veneration of Mary, and <laughs> uh, appeal to her as a mediator?" Uh, he goes into, uh, you know, he he understands uh, the 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 justification for praying to the saints, for example, and he knows that this is not quite the same thing. And he, but so he, he he's he's you know aware of that. But uh, he, he goes on to say at the very end, how did this happen when Scripture is so clear that there is only one mediator between God and men? So any thoughts you guys want to share on that theme? I'll, I'll let Glenn run with that one first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, first of all, you have the uh, angel Gabriel's, the Annunciation. That gets incorporated into the liturgy very early on. Yeah. And Mary is described early on as the Theotokos, yeah. which is Greek for God-bearer. It's translated into Latin as mother of God. Yeah. Bad translation, I yeah. would argue, it should be God-bearer. Yeah. Now, that becomes really important as in Christology, because when Nestorius comes along, Nestorius says, well, God-bearer maybe isn't the best title. Maybe we should call her the Christ-bearer. Mm -hmm. But you don't mess with the liturgy. And this causes a whole problem, and you get the whole Nestorian controversy and the Monophysite controversy and everything else coming from there. As near as I can tell, aside from the use of the, the prayer in the Annunciation, where the Annunciation turned into a prayer in the title Theotokos, Mary was not a major emphasis in the church up to that point. Yeah. The Nestorian controversy seems to catapult Mary into a more significant place in theology. Yeah. You don't even run into icons of Mary particularly, really, not even at that point. Only later do you start running into icons of Mary. I think it's a few centuries later, in fact. So that's where it's really starting off. Then in the West in particular, you get the emphasis on Christ as you're moving into the Middle Ages. You get the idea of Christ as the judge of the living and the dead. He's increasingly being a combination of, of uh, forensic justification being emphasized in the West. And with that, Christ as judge, um, people begin to be kind of afraid of Jesus. Because he's the one who's going to determine whether you go to heaven or hell. And everybody's aware of their sin. That's something that is abundantly clear from the church. And so you really want to have someone acting as, well, an advocate for you with the judge. Who better than mom? Yeah. Yeah, I've heard this particular uh, tack uh, taken a lot. You know, she's a soft-hearted person. Right. You know, and, well, and he so has to begin. honor his mother. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, and, and, so, and so what you see is in the Ave Maria, in the Hail Mary, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Mm -hmm. You see in the, um, uh, all the cathedrals are dedicated to Notre Dame, Our, Our Lady. You mm -hmm. see in the tympanum, at the scene of the Last Judgment, you see Mary interceding with Jesus, seated on the throne for the you know, the souls of the dead. You see this over and over again. So there's there's a growing emphasis on Mary for that reason. And then that moves to the idea of Mary ultimately, this is not really accepted, but there's discussion of Mary as co-redemptrix. Not so much because of that, although I think that's really the origin of it, but because um, Mary says, you know, um, so be it unto me according to God's will, you know, to, to Gabriel. And they said, if Mary had said, no, thank you, I'm not going to do this, Jesus would never have been born. Well, yeah, that's the argument. So if Mary hadn't agreed to it, salvation wouldn't have happened. That makes Mary a co-redemptrix. You know, so you get all of these kinds of things accumulating. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, there's um, there's another dimension to this too. I'd like to just briefly consider, and it doesn't. I don't know whether um, this uh, this way of thinking about Mary uh, is nece- necessary for this particular, um, I guess, regard for um, kind of uh, important women. Uh, but anyway, uh, well, you see, particularly with like Tolkien. You know, there's a, I think, a, a, a sense in which um, we should re- have a regard for uh, particular women uh, because in some sense they correspond to or reflect this significant, the significance of Mary. Um, right. When you think about, say, Tolkien's um, presentation particularly of Galadriel or, uh, you know, um, you know, you, you, get, you, 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 I, I get a sense that there's something of his Catholicism kind of coming into the, 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 yeah. the presentation. And uh, he acknowledged there, that actually. And, and, and theologically there, there are a lot of interconnections that a lot of Protestants never know what to do with. And so the only flip alternative becomes, oh, the Catholics did that, so we can't do anything with it. I mean, you have things that are clearly there, that Mary is part of the culmination of the preparation of a body that is going to become the vehicle of the incarnation. So very significant as covenant history and as a capstone of that, Um, as one who reverses, in a sense, by her grace-enabled choice of saying yes to not take the the bad fruit, but to take on her um, as as a grace the 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 you know the the action to to be the God bearer in that sense. Um, and then if you listen to the Magnificat, my soul proclaims what the greatness of the Lord. So it's humility rather than than pride motivating this and and self empowerment. Right. So we often get into this. Oh, you could say something, Chris. Well, yeah, related to that is uh, a sense of calling as a yeah. mother and how yeah. her calling as a mother corresponds to the calling of every mother. Yeah. There's, there's a sense in which um, every woman is a, is a Mary, you could say. Yeah. Now, every woman is not bearing, uh, you know, the Christ, but every woman is bearing the image of God. And then, and then, likewise, in the church, every woman is bearing covenant children, right? And so, I mean, there is, there, there are so many rich things tied to a proper understanding of the import of Mary, without having to take it into unhealthy directions of indifference or making Mary insignificant or maximizing Mary and making her kind of a co co redemptrix in, in un, you know, in unhealthy ways, as as we would see it. Well, let, let's just step back. I, I do think that there is a visceral uh, rejection of Mary by feminism. Yes, um, I, I, you know, Mary is almost uh, un uh, uh, kind of assimilatable Man. for them. There's there's nothing about Mary that they can use to pursue their program. Yeah, um, you know, uh, her significance is bearing a child and a yeah. male child at that, and submitting to the will of God, you know, all of these things make her uh, undigestible uh, by yeah. feminism, and, and yet the profundity of it here not only is the is the 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 instrument in creation to bring forth images of God, but also the one who brought forth in Mary the very image of God made flesh. I mean, what mm-hmm. higher aspect of a calling, but found in a profound powerful humility. Um, it, it is, it is, it's the reversal of the attitudes of feminism, which it's all about the other seeing that is nothing, not humble, but seeing that is basically, you know, having little significance or meaning basically being the lowest of the lows in terms of, of earthly goods, power, and meaning. And, or, uh, uh, actually in, in the language of some, uh, a kind of parasite. Yes, uh, like yeah, a, that's right. like a like a baby is a parasite. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Now, the, the other thing to note is that there are a whole host of other things. Again, going back to the the Catholic and to some extent the Orthodox side of it, uh, perpetual virginity of Mary, which was not yeah, universally right. accepted even in the early Church. 
of the Immaculate Conception, which only became doctrine in the Catholic Church in the 19th century, the Assumption of Mary, which says that she was assumed bodily in heaven after she died. You know, all of these kinds of things were other things that were added in as well over time. Yeah. And again, we don't need to, to accept those. But the fact is, as Protestants, we tend to ignore her more than we should. We pay a lot more attention to a lot of other people. I mean, I think we probably pay more attention to Ruth than we do to Mary. That's a good point. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Esther, Ruth, mm -hmm. you know, Sarah. Yep. Um, let's, uh, let's take a look uh, again at Patrick, and we'll make this the last question. I need to get going, I'm afraid, but uh, I think we can make this one pretty quick. He's asking about uh, the, the, the episode that we did on imagination and meaning. And uh, he notes uh, that uh, Bonaventure uh, and engaging with Bonaventure uh, was brought up in the show. Uh, is, there, is there something that we could recommend um, in terms of a work by Bonaventure that we could uh, recommend? Uh, any, does anything come to mind off the top of your, uh, top of your heads? What is, the, uh, what is it, the soul's flight to God? What is his uh, the journey, soul's journey to God? And that's one of his... Uh, that's one of his major works, and I'm trying to think of the. Give me a second. Well, we can always I, put something something in the show notes. A link. Yeah, to, yeah. yeah. I, I have I'll a collection of his works here, but all the titles are running together in my head at the moment. But um, he his you know his whole his whole program was around similar to what Aquinas was up to in trying to take a lot of these rich things and balance them out with a very rich view of God's transcendence, transcendent presence. And so the, uh, uh, Bonaventure is another one. There is a book by, I, I can look this one up quickly. Actually, this is, a, if someone wants to get a hold of imagination in the arts with this, um, this book is written by a very interesting guy. It's called The Father of Lights, A Theology of Beauty. And it's an engagement with Bonaventure's work. So it gets into a lot of that. And he is a the, the guy who wrote it, uh, Junius Johnson, he's a theologian and a musician. And you probably yeah, yeah. I, I I remember that book yeah yeah, yeah. I read it I said it some time back anyway we should wrap things up mainly because I got to run <laughs> but anyway <laughs> yeah. hey uh, we we want to say uh, just a final couple of things one of those things has to do with uh, our trip to the UK um, we're excited about things coming together for that we just had a conversation a minute ago with my daughter in law Whitney and she's the one who's lining up stuff for us and doing a great job. But uh, hopefully we'll have an itinerary because we've had a number of people uh, in the UK contact us about coming to see us while we're there. And we'd like to have uh, that available. So as soon as we do, uh, we will uh, get the word out probably through our, uh, through our, our podcast. Uh, not sure exactly how to do it, but we have to get it out to the people who who uh, have asked, and we don't necessarily have emails for everybody, but we'll, we'll, we'll somehow f manage to post that, or maybe we'll just have Tom read it for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we probably our main uh, the theology podcast website may be a good place, and then we can let yeah. people know to. Yeah, that would be a good place to put the hard copy. Anyway, uh, we've uh, had a number of people who've given to our Indiegogo campaign. I, I think this uh, show will be. Uh, released after that campaign is concluded but uh, you can still support us through Patreon we've got a number of folks who support us in fact uh, we've answered some of their questions today or at least tempted to and if you'd like to uh, have an opportunity to connect with us uh, you know uh, through our Patreon uh, there are ways to do that anyway like I said I gotta run I gotta get to a, a lunch meeting and uh, <laughs> I'm gonna be late <laughs> <laughs> but it's great to see you guys and uh yeah and uh we'll uh, hopefully catch you soon and uh thank you for listening to this episode of the theology podcast bye-bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. The Theology Podcast is a ministry of Trinity Reformed Church in Huntsville, Alabama. To learn more about the church, you can visit trinityreformedkirk.com, trinityreformedkirk.com.